The ball is back for the restart and bang! Top left corner! What a strike! Hey guys and welcome to this Football Manager 2020 Tactics Guide. Today we're going to be looking at our lower league 4-1-3-2 and this is going to be a sort of tutorial slash tactical analysis. We're going to start by looking at the team shape. We're then going to move on to the team instructions and the player instructions followed by the player roles and which players best fill them. We're going to jump into the match engine as well over a couple of games and we're going to dissect the tactic, see what makes it tick why it works, areas where it may not work, and what you need to do with the system as well. Uh, you should hopefully be able to take away a few tips from this to make your own tactics. That's the whole point of the video. Before we jump into the game itself, if you follow us on YouTube, please do subscribe. It helps us massively, and that way you get notified of any new videos that come out. Like the video, that would also be much appreciated. And if you're on Twitch, give us a follow. That way when we go live, you'll be able to see our live streams. Let's jump into the game. We're in game guys, this is the system, a 4-1-3-2, it's a connotation to 4-4-2 basically, um, just not using the same flat shape. 4-4-2 has done extremely well during the beta and even in the early stages of the full release I've seen quite a lot of people using it to good effect. Personally I did like it, I tested it with Everton the 4-4-2 but I found we conceded a hell of a lot of chances in behind and clear cut chances were way too high for my liking. So I was looking for a system which would work further down the leagues. Basically if you have lesser players they're going to make more mistakes. So the more risky the tactic, the more chance there is of conceding a lot of goals. I want something more secure, is what I'm saying, than that 4-4-2. So this system pulls the MC back to DMC, and he's on a support duty. So with him being on a support duty, he still gets involved in supporting the attack. He doesn't just merely defend. Um, but it gives you that extra bit of security. He stands in front of the two centre-backs, which stops these guys. Doesn't stop it because the ME still isn't perfect, uh, but it, it avoids them stepping out as often to go and try breaking up play, which is generally where we tend to get issues in behind. Uh, we have the two wingers are defensive wingers. They offer cover out wide and while again they're on support duty so that may look quite negative it isn't they get and you'll see this when we go into the match engine they get quite high forward they end up in the box quite often uh, but on the defensive side they also do get back and help out the um, inverted wing backs um, you'll again you'll see that when we go into the games going on to the instructions we're using attacking uh, I use that pretty much throughout to be honest. I tested it with Newcastle as well during that test save. If I came up against the likes of an Arsenal or a Man United I'd go to a counter or should I say cautious is what it's called now and uh, yeah if I, if I was away from home to Bournemouth or a Wolves I might do the same it was on merit but playing with York we are the best side in the league just about so I'm using attacking all the time unless I come up in the FA Cup against a big bigger team. On the instruction side of things we play with a fairly wide um, attacking width. That is completely different to our defensive width, which is narrow. Again, you'll see that in a minute when we go into the match engine, why that is. But basically, we want to be fairly wide because we want to stretch the pitch. The whole idea of a great system is utilising space, movement, and using every ounce of the pitch that's available to you. That's the me personally anyway. Some people may like to be more compact, but I don't see the point. As far as I'm concerned, the more we can spread out the opposition's positioning, the more holes are going to appear, the more chances we're going to get. So that's why we have a fairly wide width. Um, the slightly more direct passing, that is just to utilise the ball over the top when the opportunity does come up without trying to constantly look for it. I find using a standard tempo is a must in this system. The reason for that, you may be thinking, well, if you want to utilise that ball over the top, surely a much higher tempo is better. I haven't found that to be the case. I found that ended up giving away the ball way too often and actually going to a standard tempo was a nice balance. It, it basically sticks with possession oriented football, which this tactic does very well with. We run up the defence. That's really self-explanatory. 
it's it's a feature I enjoy watching in all my tactics anyway. Worked the ball into the box because did find that actually the ball was being given away quite often without that setting on. Uh, the overlap is to try and get the inverted wing backs and the defensive wingers um, working together in tandem. Uh, you'll see that in the match engine in a minute. And play out from the defence, that's again, we don't want the centre backs hoofing the ball forward. We want to be playing out from the back, we want to be holding on to the ball. In transition, and I love this little feature in the game um, over the last couple of years where you get to see the arrows. So whatever you select based on the roles you've got, this may look different in your screen. Uh, but I think it's really handy so you can get a good idea of who's going to be involved in each phase of, pay, in, in each phase of play. So we're doing a counter press uh, when possession has been lost. Now the guys that get involved in that are the two pressing forwards, the wingers, the central midfield and the DMC. All the defenders don't, uh, which is great because we want them holding that line. But when it comes to the actual counter attack itself, so these are the guys that are going to be really pushing on. There's it, it, basically, the DMC then kind of helps form that little triangle at the back so that we've got defensive cover, leaving the inverted wing backs then to get involved in the attacking phase of play. Uh, we distribute to fullbacks, just seems to work best. Throw it long because the fullbacks can be further up the pitch. And when we're out of possession, we have a dangerously high defensive line and a very high line of engagement using the offside trap because it'd be criminal not to with such a high line. Tight marking, prevent the short goal kick and we get stuck in. Quite a risky approach, I will admit that. However, the way I like to use tactics and the tactics I'll generally use for if I'm downloading them or when I'm creating them are possession orientated pressing football and the philosophy of get the ball back as quick as possible, when you get it back, hold on to it until the opportunity comes up. Now the further up the pitch you are to A, get the ball back and B, retain the ball, the less chance there is of the opposition getting too much of the ball in your final third, which is where the goals are going to come from. So it just makes sense to me that the higher up the pitch we can be in both phases of play, the better we are going to do. We're going to move on to roles guys and also which players best suit each role. Before I do, just a quick note, this tactic was actually downloaded for FM 2019. Uh, I found it on the SI Games forum, a chap called Nap created it, I'd highly recommend you go and look at his stuff, he's really good. And I basically used this for FM 2020 with a few of my own tweaks and to bring it up to date with the new game, but all the roles have remained the same. It was tested to the far end of a fart, all the players seem to interact really well and I think Nap's done a fantastic job at getting the role spot on so I wanted to keep them. With that in mind, having ball playing defenders is probably a risky tactic in the lower leagues. However, what I found is trying to change them to central defender or no nonsense centre back didn't work. They ended up hoofing the ball forward rather than playing it out. Now while we don't want them carrying the ball forward so much, we do want them picking out either the full backs or the defensive midfielder. So that's why I've kept those roles as they are. The sweeper keeper self-explanatory, we've got a high line so we're even sweeping up. The inverted wing backs. Now some people get confused by this role um, and think that it means the wing back is going to sit narrower on the pitch. This isn't the case. They will still be um, wide and they'll still attack wide it's only when they get the ball that they'll start thinking about cutting inside. So they, they basically still overlap the defensive winger, which as per the instruction, um, and equally the defensive winger comes on the inside of the inverted wing back to help cover in the defensive phase of play. Um, the DMC is fantastic because he offers that little bit of security, but being on the support duty, he does get involved in the attacking phase of play. Basically, I think the duties can be quite confusing for people. A lot think, right, I want to attack or I want to defend. If I use support, is he actually going to do either or is he just going to be stationary? Don't view the duties as whether a player is going to be moving forwards, backwards or staying still. View the duty as which phase of play he gets involved in. So with a support duty, he's going to defend 
when he needs to defend, but he's also going to get forward and support the attack when the team is going forward. The central midfielder is our main man. You see this space all around here? It's vital. He actually attacks that really well. The central midfielder on the attack duty acts more like an attacking midfielder. Now what's really interesting is I think he does that because of the space created in this area here just behind the two forwards. The pressing forwards get really high up the pitch which you'll see in a minute and they hug the defensive line. That stretches the pitch leaving a chasm of space but also with all the players that get involved in the attacking phase it gives the opposition's defence something to think about. The defensive wingers like I said before they do get forward, they get inside the box but they also defend as well. As for what type of players you want to be looking for, the pressing forwards really you want to be getting fast forwards that can finish. Good work weight would be a bonus, but speed is the most important thing. I personally like forwards that are quite technical as well. The central midfielder, he needs to be an all-rounder. Ideally good physical stats, but technical ability is really important. If you're playing higher up with the tactic, someone like a Danny Olmo would work very nicely in that sort of role. I also thought that Madison did quite well under Leicester. Um, the defensive wingers, you want speed, skill, dribbling ability. These guys are going to carry the ball and they're going to need to create that little bit of magic, but also a crossing ability as well because they do hug the line at times. Now, they do have an instruction, a player instruction, of sit narrower. That basically pulls them in closer to the box, which actually gives them more chances on goal. Um, so again, you're going to want someone who's a bit of an all-rounder there, but speed and dribbling are really, really vital. Your two centre-backs, I won't worry too much about the technical side. The most important thing is not to have slow centre-backs. Due to the high line, you're going to get caught out. Inverted wing-backs just the best players you can get for this role. Speed is really important because they do get involved in the attacking phase, but really you want them to be able to cross, you want them to be able to move with the ball. Right, let's jump into the match engine and see how this puppy works, shall we? So we're going to start quickly looking at the Gateshead game, guys. This is away from home. We won 4-1 and created all sorts of opportunities, so there's loads to look at. Uh, we'll begin with the defensive phase. So we've got four pretty clear lines of defence. The two strikers, which are pressing forwards, they stay forward. Their job is to stretch the pitch so that when we do get the ball back, there's loads of space to attack or there's a ball in behind. The <clears throat> four midfielders, they apply pressure whenever the ball or possession gets near to their kind of defensive zone, shall we say. And Jique, who is my DMC, he drops a little bit further back than the central midfielder, which is really important because if there are any players trying to utilise that hole there, i.e. this striker, Kekodi, maybe dropping in, or one of the midfielders, central midfielders, pushing forward, he can deal with that. The MC deals with everything else. Two wingers, naturally, deal with the wide play. Quite a narrow shape, as we said at the start, but that's, that's good. It's nice and compact, and you'll see why that works in just a second. So let's play the clip. So the ball's getting moved around. It eventually works its way out wide, but we've got loads of cover. No real options for Gateshead, and the move breaks down. The next highlight's an interesting one, guys. This shows our transitional phase of play and who gets involved. So my right back, Pearson, has the ball and during a throw-in. He gives it to Long, to Gray, my striker who's on the shoulder. Um, meanwhile, the other striker is going to be getting in behind and making that run, stretching the pitch, opening up all this space here, but also distracting a couple of defenders while he's doing it. This is what I'm talking about when it comes to movement being so important. If you have quite a stationary tactic where players aren't trying to open up the pitch and give you space in behind or in the pockets, then players are going to have nowhere to go, the ball's going to end up back with the opposition. So it goes to Gray, who chests it down. He's making his move inside. Now, note these two guys. Otranto's my central midfielder on attack duty, and he is attacking the space like an attacking midfielder. That's because there's a space there to attack, because there's not another player 
in his way in a role that is basically snifling his ability to be able to get on the ball. And Zik, my DMC, yes he's on a support duty, but like I said before, don't visualise support duty as being a stationary role, it's not. All it means is they get involved in both phases of play, and that's precisely what he's doing, he's going to support the attack. While my wingers get forward as well, everybody's going to create an overload in the attacking phase. Now what happens here, Gray actually makes amazing little run himself. This is why I say that speed, dribbling and general ability with the pressing forwards is quite important because they do tend to do this. But the only reason he can do that, look, is because my MC has come from so deep that a couple of players don't have a clue what to do about him. And these two guys are a little bit nervous about my striker. Meanwhile, you've got all this attacking overload happening. You've got my wing backs getting forward, my wingers getting forward. It's a massive overload which they can't cope with. So what happens? Nobody makes a challenge because they don't know what to do and we have a cracking chance. I also want to show you what happens when the strikers are on the defensive shoulder which is their main duty rather than one of them getting involved quite early in the attack. So from here, the opposition have had a throwing. They've pretty quickly lost possession. Garcia, my right winger, has picked up the ball and he's about to make a short run. <clears throat> Note though where both my strikers are. They're very high up. It's created an awful lot of space here, a pocket to go into, but it's also created the opportunity to get the ball over the top. So Garcia makes his run. Both strikers, sensing the danger, make their move and then the ball goes through. Two options we had there, two options to go in behind and because the defence were caught out and dispossessed so deep they hadn't had time to get back. Now Gray could play the ball through here, he can carry on himself, what he does is he goes all selfish, carries on himself and screws it up. But that's not the point, the play is created because of the pressing forwards pushing up high on the pitch and creating the space. All great tactics are a balance between risk and reward. This tactic has the risk of a high line, high line of engagement, attacking strategy, but it's outbalanced by the fact we've got a DMC, we've got defensive wingers, and some other players on duty of support, which gets them involved in the defensive phase. It doesn't apply as much to set pieces, unfortunately, and this is where we get caught out in this highlight. So the ball comes in, all the players are attacking in the set piece, but we get caught out not getting back quick enough, only two players left to cover and they almost score. Gates said don't take their chance thankfully but that's not the point of this highlight. It's just to show you that this can happen. This is why having fast centre backs is important so that they can deal with situations like this but also physically capable team in general is very helpful. Now you may think well why not just change things up a little bit so it is even more secure well no, because that would then take away from the attacking phase and the transitional phase of the tactic, which if they don't work, you end up under even more pressure anyway. So by thinking you're going more defensive in your approach, you're actually not. You're actually causing yourself more problems because you're having less of the ball and you're ending up having to deal with more of the opposition. Moving on to the Kidderminster game guys, we won this one 5-0 and created all sorts of opportunities. I selected a highlight just to show you how attacking those defensive wingers really are. This is in the attacking phase of play of course. So you've got the two strikers stretching the pitch, but look at those two defensive wingers. That's my MR, that's my ML. They're almost forming a front four. And Zik, my DMC, is on the ball with my MC making a run in behind, also offering a short passing option. But what's quite interesting as well is my full backs are almost acting as central midfielders, used, utilising that space. So we'll see what happens during the move. Ball goes out to one of the full backs who makes it out to Garcia. He's now going to take on his man with two striking options to pick out. My MC Otranto is making a run in behind as well, but this guy is making a move to the far stick, a toy. He's my left midfielder. This is why I was telling you getting well-rounded wingers is quite important because they are going to get involved in the box. As you're about to see, Garcia gets his cross in and a toy's there to score. During the next highlight, guys, you're going to see two things. Here the high line of engagement and how quickly we're able to win the ball back when we lose it because that happens quite a bit due to the very poor lower league and 
slash match engine passing that's going on here, but also what positions that gets players into once we've got the ball back. This is really important because it helps us hold on to possession. Having so many players in a position to offer support straight away from winning the ball back is vital. Let's click play. So, as you can see, we just won the ball back there because we're quite high up, loads of passing options. Almost lost it, but Pearson straight in again with the tackle, back to Garcia. The ball's just getting moved around. The other thing to note as well is Pearson and Ferguson are my inverted wing backs. See how they've now moved inside. The reason for that is there's not much point in them going out wide. And inverted wing backs, they do cut inside when they're on the ball, which Pearson just has been. So they're actually filling in that central midfield gap that we have. Remember, we've only got one central midfielder in this system. The other's a DMC who sat back there. So they come in and they plug that area. You see the ball, there's always a passing option on as well. Note how we could go to Njik, we could go to Atranto, we could go to Ferguson. We've got the switch available as well. There's always a passing option on. And eventually we do get to Toy, who gets the ball in. And our Tranto's arriving way late from the MC position to score. Last highlight, guys, and just a really quick note from me. Uh, I want to go over the inverted win backs one more time. Yes, you saw them quite narrow in the last clip where they were filling in that MC role. That was due to not needing to be out wide. Here you're going to see the opposite where actually their starting positions are quite wide during the attack. That's because there isn't as much space to utilise in the middle. So we've got Ferguson here. He's been offering the width throughout the whole of this transitional phase so far. But when he picks up the ball, he is going to cut inside, which is what they're commanded to do, before he eventually finds Dyer on the other wing-back position. Again, he isn't too narrow, who then finds York, my mid uh, winger, and he goes and scores. So, killer Dunner. There's Ferguson. He's offering a bit of width, cuts inside, then finds the other wing-back, who gets it to the winger, who scores. The whole point of showing that clip was the inverted wing backs will do what they need to do based on your system. So yes they will um, cut inside, yes they will sit narrow, but when they need to they will also be wide. So don't be scared of using that role because A you think they have to be able to use their other foot and B because you think they're going to be too narrow on your system. It's not the case. If that is the case in your system, your system isn't working with the interaction between roles. Okay guys, that about sums it up. I think we've covered everything I wanted to today. Um, if you want to download the tactic, you can do that. That's going to be in the description on YouTube and also on the post on our website. Takeaways from today's video are tactics are all about balance. Uh, it is a risk and reward formula. You need to get the interaction with roles right. Just be, you may have a tactic that you've created and it may be on the cusp of working but if one or two roles aren't quite correct and they're not interacting with each other then it will ruin the whole thing. It's about stretching the pitch, finding a way of creating more space, distracting the opposition and basically opening up the holes. So have a play around, lots of testing would be my main tips and be a perfectionist. Thank you so much for following, um, I've really enjoyed making this video. If you guys want to see more, then make sure you subscribe on YouTube and give us a thumbs up, give us a like, that would be much appreciated. Uh, equally, we've got so much content on the website now on footballmanagerstory.com. Um, so get yourself over there and have a look at that. And thanks for popping in, guys.